But I want us to turn to John chapter 4 today. And we have been going through the Gospel of John, and in God's providence, we come here today to John chapter 4. We've been looking at the Gospel of John, and of course, the Gospel of John speaks. You, you, if you flip over, don't do that, but if you flip over to chapter 20, you'll read about the reason that John wrote the Gospel. John said, I write these things to you so that you will believe and know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in your name. So he is most certainly writing to people who are yet to be saved. And yet we know as we read the Gospel of John, we're reading a great book for Christians. So we have been going through the Gospel of John. And what we have seen, some of the things we've seen so far, we have seen that Jesus Christ is the fullest revelation of who God is. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Christ is the Word. He has revealed God to us. We have read and studied about John the Baptist and his statements and his testimony of who Jesus is. He's the Lamb of God, and He is the one who has come to baptize in the Holy Spirit. My friends, we are Baptists. We are free will Baptists. Don't be afraid, though, of the Spirit of God, my friends. What a neglected doctrine. I don't even want to say doctrine, but you know what I mean, of the Spirit of God. We looked at some of the early followers of Jesus and their testimony of who Jesus is. He's the King of Israel. He's Jacob's ladder. Do you remember that? Jesus said, you will see the angels of God ascending and descending on me. Jesus says, I am the way to God. I'm Jacob's ladder in the Old Testament. We saw Jesus turn water into wine, His first sign, showing His power and who He was. We saw Jesus come into the temple, God coming into the temple, and cleansing the temple, and then saying, I'll give you a sign, destroy this temple, and I'll raise it up in three days. Jesus Christ is the temple of God. We saw the fact that Jesus knows all men. He had no reason for anyone to testify about man because He knew what was in man. And that's why He wasn't trusting Himself to many of the people who believed in His name. He knew what was in man. He understood it perfectly. We saw in John 3 that Nicodemus was told, you must be born again. We saw in John 3, God's love and sinner's love. God loves the world. God loves sinners and wants everyone saved. But sinners love darkness, the Bible says. What contrast is that? And then the last time we were in the Gospel of John, we saw that Jesus Christ has no equal. And one of the reasons why that is true, one of the many reasons why that is true, is because our relationship with God is dependent upon our relationship with Jesus Christ. There's a lot of people today who reject Jesus, but they think they have God. The Bible says, no. If you will not honor my Son, God says, you will not have me. And now we turn this morning to John chapter 4 about the woman of Samaria. It's a long passage. We are not going to look at the entire passage today. But what I want us to see is something from these first 18 verses. And I want us to read these first 18 verses together today. I want you to remember what I said a minute ago. At the end of John chapter 2, Jesus says, I don't need anyone to testify of me. John is saying that about Jesus. Because He knows all men. And what we see is Christ's dealings with people. Nicodemus comes to him. Christ knew his heart, knew what to say. And now you have the woman of Samaria coming to Jesus, and Jesus knows what to say to her. Read with me, please, the first 18 verses of John chapter 4. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus Himself did not baptize but His disciples, He left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But He needed to go through Samaria. So He came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. 
a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well, and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands. And the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. I want us today at the beginning to do what others have done. I want us to contrast the main character in this story, besides Jesus, of course, with the main character from the first part of John 3 that we know so well. It's very remarkable, honestly, for us to look at John chapter 3, the story about Nicodemus, and then very shortly come to the story of the Samaritan woman. The reason is, one of the reasons is, if, they would, if both of these people, Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman, would walk into most churches, we would think they are radically different from one another. The fact is, they're just the same. Listen to some of the characteristics of Nicodemus. I think probably all of us here know something of the story of Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a leader of Israel. Do you remember that? He was a man of reputation. He was a man of respect. Any church would have loved to have had him not only as a member, certainly, but as a deacon, if not a pastor. He was a religious man. He was a man that knew the Bible. He was the man of the right religion, friends. Nicodemus at that time was a Jew. That was the religion to be. That was God's religion. He was a man of the right religion. He was a moral man. He was a teacher. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, a very select company of Israel that were leaders and looked upon. No doubt Nicodemus had a nice family. In our way of speaking, he probably had a nice house. He probably had two cars at least. He maybe even had a boat. Nicodemus was a good, quote-unquote, person. He was a man that fasted. He tithed. He prayed. He did so many things well, this Nicodemus did. He had connections. Some of you have connections. Some of you at work at times have not had connections. And that's why you didn't get the promotion. And you know that. But you just accepted that. You didn't have the connections that the other person had. You didn't know the people that the other person knew. And yet, when you read in the Bible, what you're seeing is Nicodemus knew people. If we are to take the Greek literally in John chapter 3, it says Nicodemus was the teacher of Israel. He was the teacher of Israel. That's Nicodemus. Here's this woman, though, that we come to, we read about, this Samaritan woman. This Samaritan woman is not a moral woman. She's not like Nicodemus. Jesus comes to her and Jesus says, you've had five husbands. No doubt all five husbands had not died. They had divorced her. They would rejected her. This woman had hurt This woman not only has hurt, not only had five husbands, but Jesus says the the person you are living with now is not your husband. No doubt sexual relationships were happening outside of marriage. 
Someone says Nicodemus is very much different than this woman. This woman, no doubt, it appears in the text, had a stigma about her. What I mean is this. She came to draw water at the sixth hour. Now, in, like I've said before, when you're reading about time in the Bible, you take the hour and you add it to 6 a.m. You get what the hour is then. She came at noon to draw water. It's the hottest time of the day. It's the day most people aren't going to be there. And the reality is, most likely, this woman didn't want to be seen and other people didn't want to see her. They knew the type of life that she was living. That's just the facts of it. She was not considered a moral woman. She was not considered the so-called right ethnicity at that time. I say so-called because ethnicity means nothing to God today, and it should mean nothing to us. There's only one race, and it's human. That's all we have. This woman was a Samaritan. What's that mean? The Assyrians came in to Samaria in 721 B.C. The, Assyri the Assyrians came in, they captured Assyria, they captured Samaria, and most of the people of Samaria who were Jews, they drove away, but they left some there. And what happened was this, the Assyrians intermarried with the Samaritans. So what you have, if you're a Samaritan, you're part Jew and part Gentile. The Gentile, like one man said, wants nothing to do with the Samaritans. And the Jew wants nothing to do with the Samaritans. They're part Jew. They're part Gentile. She's of the wrong so-called ethnicity. Nicodemus is of the right so-called ethnicity. He was a Jew at this time. This woman not only did not have the right so-called ethnicity and wasn't a moral woman, but this woman of Samaria did not have the right religion. You see, the Samaritans had their own religion. The Jews had a different religion. The Samaritans in around 400 B.C. built their own temple that would be destroyed at about 130 B.C. And the Samaritans did not accept the whole Old Testament. The Samaritans accepted the first five books, the Pentateuch. And the books they accepted, they changed some things in that book. She wasn't a moral woman. She wasn't of the so-called right ethnicity. She wasn't of the right religion. And she wasn't of the so-called right gender of that day. She was a woman. In fact, look at verse 27. And at this point, His disciples came and they marveled that He talked with a woman. At this day and time, she had a lot of things, some rightly, some not rightly, against her. If both of these people would have walked into our church service, some people judging on the flesh would have said these people are totally different people. And yet the Bible says these people are exactly the same in many ways. Because Jesus Christ would look at the most religious man of His day, a man who is steeped in religion, and Jesus would say, you're not even saved, Nicodemus. It doesn't matter if you wear a suit. It doesn't matter if you carry a Bible to church. None of that matters, Nicodemus. You're not born again. You're not even saved, Nicodemus. And then here comes the woman who's not moral. The woman who's had a difficult background. The woman who has been hurt deeply and that God loves deeply. This woman would come and Jesus would say to her, you need living water. They have the same need. I used to work at a 24-hour drug rehabilitation center. And I used to tell the clients there at times, I would say to them, you know what? You're here. Your problem is really easy to see. I mean, you know about it, or hopefully you know about it. The people around you, they know about it. You're on drugs sometimes. You know, you get out of your mind. But the people out there, they're just as sinful. And they have just the same problems, except they show up in different ways. And sometimes these problems of the people out there, they show up in a certain way to our culture that it almost makes them look like they're righteous. And it's just as big of a problem as the person over here in the rehab, friends. I'm telling you, Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman were one and the same. They were lost. And they needed Jesus Christ as their Savior. They need living water. Who do you identify with? 
Maybe you're here and you identify more with Nicodemus. Maybe you're here and you identify more with the Samaritan woman. Well, what I say to you is it doesn't matter because Jesus wants you. Just like He wants everybody else. And we want to help as a church. The woman had five husbands. She was living with a man. She was an outcast in her society. People looked down upon her. What I get, one of the things that I get from this passage, and other people have seen this in this passage, is that this woman, and I think this is probably the reason Jesus says you need living water instead of being born again. Though they're really the same thing. Jesus says you need living water because this lady may have spent her whole life looking for something to satisfy her. Going from man to man. Wanting that cool drink of water that would not leave her for once. And Jesus says, if you would have known who I am, I would have given you living water. There's many people like this today. Again, it always shows up differently, doesn't it? We praise the athlete who is just as a, an idolater on his athletics as a, as a person on drugs is to their drugs. You, t- you hear about these old famous athletes. These people that all of us would know their names if we mentioned them. The great men who made something of themselves. And their body gets older and they break down and they retire and now they're miserable all the days of their life. Why? They can't be with their idol anymore. Sports was their idol. They're looking for something to satisfy them. They can't find it though because they can't play anymore. They're getting too old. And if they play, they would tarnish their legacy now if they went back. So they stay away, but they kills them on the inside because that was their God. That was their God, you see. People, maybe you're here, you're like this. Sometimes you're happy, you're watching a movie, you're enjoying it, you're smiling, and all of a sudden it comes back to you. As you're smiling, I'm missing something in my heart. I'm missing something. You have people, I think one of the, if not the number one reason people begin to drink or take drugs, they begin to take substance, is because they no longer want to listen to their conscience. They're tired of going to bed with a dirty conscience. And they say, oh, I can't take it anymore. Give me a drink. We're looking for something. It's like when I was a kid, I'd play a video game. I'd just play it up for a month and then I want something else. We're all looking for something. Our hearts are restless, said Augustine, until they find their rest in God and their peace in God. People are always looking for something new. They're never satisfied. They just want one more dollar more or they want to change jobs all the time. Sometimes that may be a good thing, but sometimes they're changing jobs because they just can't be satisfied. They're changing spouses. Why? They just can't get satisfied and contentment. They're trying to find their satisfaction in their spouse or their job instead of God though. Sexual sin, you begin with something small and it grows and grows. You begin with a look at somebody else's spouse and it grows and it grows and it grows and it grows and it's something more. Money. You know, one thing that we need to think about is this. We, we live really in a secular age today in many ways. Really what's happening from what I understand is this. People at the same time are becoming more secular and people at the same time are becoming more religious. On both spectrums. But what's happening is this. When you look at people, you should know this. All of us will worship something. My friends, if you're here today, I can guarantee this. You worship. Your family members who may never go to church, or you, maybe you, you that are here, you know somebody down the street, and they're not religious at all. They're worshiping though something. Because God has made us to worship. People worship ideals. They worship people. They worship politics. That's one of the reasons we have so much so much destruction right now in politics because people worship politics. That's one of the reasons. Not the only reason. But it's their idol. And my goodness, if somebody tries to tear down my God, I will try to defend Him. 
Same way with politics. Somebody tries to break down my politics, he's my God, and I'll defend it. People worship pets. Now, I love our dog. I hope you, if you have pets, I hope you love them and treat them well. But people today worship their pets. They love their pets more than they love their children. It's an idol to them. Science, we worship science. We, we think the latest journal that comes out has to be true. Science is a wonderful servant, but a terrible master. Terrible master. One of the reasons you see sometimes Islam and radical Islam rising, people can't understand it. Why? I just can't understand. Why are people in the modern age doing that? Here's one of the reasons why, like others have said. When you tell people there is no God, they will find something to worship, even if it's a false religion. When you come to people and you begin to teach children that God didn't create the earth and that the Bible's not true and we're just here just to do what we want to, they will find something to worship, even if it's radical Islam. I want you to listen to Jeremiah. Here is what's going on in America. We think... We think that we are advanced. We think we're modern men. We think, oh, we have, not only have we gone to the moon, we've hung the moon. We think we're something great. But man's problem has never changed. And I want you to listen to what Jeremiah 2 says. Jeremiah, the Lord says this through His prophet, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. The Lord says, I am the fountain of living water. I give you life. I give you purpose. I do all of this. And yet you have forsaken me, you have made for yourself wells, and these wells cannot even hold water for me. In Jeremiah chapter 17, you hear something very similar. Verse 13, where the Bible says this, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be ashamed. Those who depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. And as you turn back to John chapter 4, what we see here is this. The fountain of living water has come up to this lady. And he has said, in effect, it appears... You have spent your whole life drinking this, drinking that, going for whatever you think will satisfy that restlessness in your heart, give you peace when you lay down at night because of the wrongs that you have done. But listen, lady, to me, if you knew who I was, you would have asked me for living water and I would have given it to you. What is Jesus Christ offering to this lady? Well, look with me back in John chapter 4, verse 10. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked Him and He would have given you living water. Jesus calls living water first, look what He says, if you knew the gift of God. Living water today is a gift that God gives to us. It's not something you work for. It's not something you dress up for. It's not something you go and interview for. It's a gift that God gives us. Now, I want you to turn to John 15. John 15. Now, friends, I, do, I, normally don't, I normally don't say things like this, but as you turn, let me just say this. We're going to be a little bit longer than normal today. But my friends, my goodness, when we're watching the Georgia Bulldogs or the Alabama Crimson Tide and they go in overtime, we think it's a great game. My friends, we're in the, we're in the people of God today listening to the Word of God. John chapter 15, verse 25. Jesus is speaking here. I want us to understand something about this gift. This gift. Jesus says this, But this happened, that the Word might be fulfilled which is written in their law. Now listen to what it says. They hated Me 
without a cause. Jesus says, this is just a fulfillment of what is written in their law. These people hate me, says Jesus, and they have no reason whatsoever to hate me. Now we find out a lot from this passage about grace. I know that sounds strange to you, but there's a lot about grace here. And here's the reason why. I want you to turn to Romans 3, or just listen if you want. Romans chapter 3. As you're turning there to verse 24, just think about the Lord Jesus Christ. People hated Him for no reason. Jesus did good, and they gave to Jesus something He didn't deserve. Jesus loved them, and because He loved them, they hated Him. There's no reason for this, friends. But here's what you find in Romans 3, 24. The Bible says, "...being justified freely by His grace." through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That word freely there is the exact same word from John 15, without a cause. What I want us to see is the living water that the Lord Jesus offers to us, He gives to us without a cause. That's what a gift is. If, if I give you, I was speaking about this on Wednesday night, if you all work 40 hours... And you go to your boss, and your boss says, you know what, you don't deserve this, but I'm going to give you this anyway. Here's your check this week. You'd be a little upset about that. Because a gift is not something you earn. A gift is something you didn't earn. And what you have here is Jesus Christ coming to this lady. And the Lord Jesus Christ says to this lady, if you knew the gift of God, you don't deserve this. Nicodemus doesn't deserve this. I, as a preacher, do not deserve this. Brother Jacob doesn't deserve this. Brother Danny doesn't deserve this. None of us deserves this. But Jesus says, this is the gift of God. You don't deserve it. I'll freely give it to you, though. He calls it the gift of God. Look what he says next here in John 4, verse 10. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked Him and He would have given you living water. It's living. It's life. We drink water. I drink a lot of water. But we are drinking water in one sense. It keeps us alive. But this is living water. He's not speaking about just keeping you alive. The lady's confused like Nicodemus. She misunderstands something. The water that Jesus gives though is living water. It gives us life. Listen to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, my friends, verse 4, starting there. The Bible says this. But God, who is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses. Before I became a Christian, I was dead. And I wonder, have we ever seen ourselves as dead in sin? Though you may have never pictured it like that or understood it, if you have never seen yourself as lost and in need of a Savior, my friends, how can you be saved today? One of the prerequisites of becoming a Christian is to know that I need to become a Christian. One of the prerequisites that we have of being a Christian is knowing that I deserve to go to hell. For that is why Jesus has come, one reason to save me from hell and sin. It says here, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace, you have been saved. What is this? This living water gives us life, my friends. Some, I don't, some, some, um, there's many people in this community that confesses to be Christians. They have no love for the Bible. They don't love to pray. They don't love the fellowship of other Christians. They don't like to speak about God. My friends, they are dead in sins. When I was a kid, I would rather go squirrel hunting 
to go to Sunday school. My grandpa, who was a lost man, got on to me about that one day. He said, he, said, he mildly rebuked me. He said, no, you need to go to Sunday school. I wanted to go to school. I grew up in church. I didn't care about church. I didn't care about Sunday school, friends. I didn't read my Bible. Why would I? But when God came to me, my life changed. I became alive to God. I now desired the Word of God. I now desired Christian fellowship. I now desired, though I had to grow in it, certainly. I now desired to worship God. It's God, our Creator. I loved Him, and I wanted to be with Him, and I wanted to be with His people, and I wanted to be with my pastor, because I had so many questions I didn't know the answer to, and I needed help. I needed God. I needed other Christians to help me. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 2. We're talking about living water, my friends. What is this living water actually? What is it actually? Jesus calls it the gift of God. We're going to see a passage in John in a moment that makes it even clearer. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Then Peter said to him, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Living water is the gift of God. The Spirit of God is the gift of God. Chapter 8, again, in the book of Acts, verse 20. The Bible says, But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you. He's talking about Simon who tried to buy the Spirit of God and the ability to give the Spirit of God. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. What's the gift of It's the Spirit of God. Look in chapter 10, verse 45. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. Chapter 11, verse 17. The Bible says, If therefore God gave them the same gift as He gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? My friends, this gift of living water that Jesus speaks about is the gift of the Holy Spirit. He says to this woman, the Spirit of God can quench your thirst. The Spirit of God can give you purpose in life. The Spirit of God can give you eternal life, He will say later in the passage. The Spirit of God satisfies you. Let me tell you, if you're satisfied in life this morning without God, my friends, it's like a sick man who's asleep. He doesn't know he's sick. There's many sick people today that are so sick they have to put them to sleep for a time. And while they are asleep, they don't know they're sick. I was the same way. I wanted to go squirrel hunting, forget about church. I wanted to go golfing. I don't want to go to church. I want to do all these other things. Until God in His mercy took me and shook me. And as I walked on that golf course, oh, friends. As I, it began with watching a... And there's some good Christian shows on television. It began by watching a good Christian show on television. A man talking about sin. A man talking about the commandments of God. And oh, my soul began con convicted. And I tried to, get, honestly, I tried to get rid of it. I tried to, in one sense, do what the Bible said. But I tried to get rid of this conviction. And God in His mercy wouldn't get rid of it. And I lived constantly, just about it, under this conviction. I'd wake up in the morning. I'm not saying you have to have my experience, but I would wake up in the morning and it felt like a hand was around my throat. Maybe that was God calling me to preach. I don't know for sure. But God woke me up. I'm telling you, once you wake up, you better not go back to sleep. Look in John chapter 7. 
As you're turning there, some of you here may have had the Spirit of God speak to your heart before and you said no. And maybe you went years without feeling the Spirit of God come to you again. If God is beginning a work in your heart this morning, please don't reject it. Don't turn away from it. When the Word of God is sown, the devil comes and takes the seed out of the heart of those who will not understand, so they will not believe. If you're here this morning and you know you're not right with God, don't leave this place until you know it. Until something's happened in your heart. John 7. How do we receive this living water? Start in verse 37. Listen to what he says. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. And we'll stop there. Friends, if you're here and, and conviction has set into your heart, and you're being troubled about sins, you're being troubled about things, you want to come to Christ, turn from your sins and come and believe in Jesus. There's many people today, some at least would say to you, you've got to do something. You've got to come forward. Now, you may have been saved coming forward. Praise God for that. But listen, you can be saved in your seat. That's what matters. Your heart is what matters to God. You need to do business now as I preach, not at the end of the service necessarily. There's many people who say, yes, yes, we, we can be partially saved, but it's not until we're baptized in a certain way. My friends, there's nothing in the Bible about that. We are saved before we are baptized because baptism is the picture of what has happened in our hearts. And just like in the, in the book of Acts, you can be baptized and come up a sinner still. Something has happened in our hearts, friends. Jesus says, if you will come to me and believe that I am He, living waters will flow inside of you. I want you to turn, turn to Revelation 22. This is the last scripture I'm going to ask you to turn to. But as you're turning, I want to tell you about another verse in Romans. Revelation 22, as you turn there. Revelation 22, 17, we'll read in a moment, but listen to Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you know when I'm the happiest as a Christian? I'm the happiest as a Christian when I'm resting in Christ the most and believing in Him. Joy and peace comes to my heart. You may be lost today. What I would say to you is come to Christ. Believe and be saved. Leave your sins. It doesn't matter what you've done in your life, friends. It doesn't matter if you've been more like Nicodemus or more like the Samaritan woman. It doesn't matter. God loves you. And if you come and turn from your sins and come to Him, God will have mercy and forgive you. And you may be a Christian here, as many of us are today. What I would say to us, in my own words, is we need to drink of this living water every day. Every day drink of this living water. Every day come, enjoy Him. And as you do that, you will be built up. But here's the final verse I want to read today. Revelation 22, verse 17. Listen to the beautiful Language. It's, it's, it's a language throughout the Scripture. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. And let him who thirsts, Come. 
Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Take the water of life today is what I say to you. If you're a Christian, take it up again and again and again and again. But don't leave here until you have this living water. 